Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. I'm here with Jay Richards of the Heritage Foundation, a prolific author, great friend, great polymath, knows a lot about a lot of things. That's why so much fun to talk with. And we've been talking about uh, how we define male and female, and it's obviously a hot topic today. Now we want to shift to another topic in the insane asylum, mm -hmm. which is uh, climate change yeah. and the climate change agenda. And uh, you've, you've written about climate in your book. I think it's, uh, yes. it's uh, let me re recollect the title. It's uh, something domain. Do uh, you remember your title? Well, anyway, it's, it's about the climate. Yeah, it's about the Jump climate. In. Absolutely. And so... Uh, and you may not know, I've, I've been interested in this topic actually for decades. And the discussion about gender ideology and, and climate change are actually related. And here's how they're related. In both cases, we're dealing with an ideology that falls apart on close inspection, closer inspection, masquerading as careful science. Um, this is something I myself, I think from studying the philosophy of science, I'm sort of, a, I'm acutely sensitive to but is the use of say that again yeah because that's worth people putting into their memory bank absolutely that it both again. gender the, the sort of gender question and the climate change question we're dealing with a, a bad ideology masquerading as good science okay and so if you study the history and philosophy of science you know kind of you've seen this happen and so you recognize the same thing with covid right i mean this is the reason i think some people that just fell for it immediately, and others thought, mm, okay, wait, I think the lockdown. Remember when our idea. show on COVID got banned? Exactly. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, I helped you get helped your first show banned. Right? Hey, I helped suppose. us both. But yeah, exactly. You got your first show banned talking yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Things that I'm, I would be quite certain are now completely uncontroversial, at least, you know, should yes. be, right? But at the time, we're just outrageous. Um, and so you really, really need to understand how to recognize, okay, is this based on real scientific evidence and study and careful consideration, or is this an ideology? Every ideology in the modern world is going to claim to be based on science because that's the kind of, so the, science is this, they're the, science is sort of the keeper of the public domain. Might have been in, in the Middle Ages, it would have been the church and the, the clerics. Uh, science now sort of has that position. So everyone from Marx the president wants to appeal to science for their ideology. And so climate, uh, the sort of whole climate debate does this as well. Now, of course, there is a climate science. It's a multidisciplinary field that involves everything from solar physics to dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings and things like that, and um, you know, various kind of paleoclimatology, all this different, these different kinds of science in which we try to figure out what's happening in the Earth's climate in the past, in the present, in the future, and what might be affecting it. So that's a, that's a real science. But what I'll, let's call it the kind of hysteria over anthropogenic climate change. So the hysteria over the idea that humans are not only affecting the climate, but are affecting it dramatically and destructively. Uh, that is just simply not based on a fair and honest assessment of the evidence. Well, I love the way you've attacked it in your book because it's, I guess I love it because it's the way I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is number one is the worth warming. Yep. Number two, if it is warming, are we causing it? Mm -hmm. Number three, uh, if if the Earth is warming and we're causing it, is that bad? Uh, the fourth one is, if the Earth is warming and we're causing it, and that's bad, would the proposed solutions make any make any difference? Yeah. And then uh, and then. The and then the question is, what should we do instead? Because the yeah. answer to number four is no. The the, the Paris. Uh, you know, climate Doesn't protocols. Get you there. It's just not going to do a darn thing. Um, and all these crazy proposals for, you know, um, carbon zero by 2035 or whatever. It's impossible. It help help me out. What's carbon zero? Mean? The idea what's, of net carbon, what's net yeah. neutral? Is so, that the yeah, same the, thing as so carbon net zero? Net neutrality had to do, yeah, with, the, uh, of course, with, uh, you know, internet policy. Net zero or carbon zero is just the idea that you're going to reach a stage in which we're not adding any carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And so maybe we're not removing it, but we're not adding any. Now, the problem is that CO2 is a product of combustion. It's sort of a product of almost all of our industrial activity. And so to transition to a form of energy or energy resource that does not release 
you know, any CO2, it, it's going to have to be something completely different than what we're doing. Um, and it's not going to be so-called renewables like solar uh, or wind, first of all, because those are fabulously expensive, they're intermittent, and they themselves, to maintain and to build, require a lot of uh, use of hydrocarbons. Well, I, I, I want to get to your one, two, three, four. Yes. But I do want to, I think I can't, I, it, it, it dawned on me, I don't know, a couple months ago, that for all this obsession with climate change and CO2 and the earth warming, that the solutions, mm -hmm. if it's wind and solar, are massively destructive of oh, habitat. Absolutely. Massive destructive of, yeah. of species. Yes. And are anti-human. And are anti-human and, and pro-China. And pro-China. Yeah, it's just like everything so, bad. So we yes. run the table. You're, yes, <laughs> exactly. And so you can see why certain people would like us to imagine we're going to solve this problem. If you're President assume G. It's a problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Now, it, it, the, way I, I, the way I say that, there are some people that sincerely believe that this is a catastrophe. And you can tell that they're serious because they recognize the problem. They say, okay, well, I think we gotta, we've got to pivot away from using hydrocarbons. What's the live alternative? Nuclear power. Right, but most of the people advocating this will not talk about nuclear power, which proves that they're not serious. Because it's part of the degrowth agenda. Absolutely, that, I mean, a lot I mean, of this. I mean, World Economic about. Forum's right out there. Absolutely, with that. it's degrowth, and in some, in some of the folks, I quote some of them in the book, are quite explicit about this. I mean, the, they they imagine that sort of pristine nature, untouched by humans, that's the ideal, and anything that human beings do to change or transform. The environment that's bad well I, I i love the way you tie it into the bible yeah which is something that is often done and it's flat wrong who's it lynn white I lynn guess. white it's a famous article yeah he um, wrote an ecological crisis based on the bible and, and we're he said we're virtuous because we reject the christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence except to serve men. That's right. This is in every environmental ethics textbook you can find, this article. So the claim was that the biblical idea is that the only purpose for nature is to serve human beings. The problem is that's not what the Bible says at all. Uh, human beings are sort of in Genesis crowning achievement of the creation, but God in, in Job, you know, he calls Job and Job's uh, um, accusers uh, before him and says, you know, where were you, do you when I, you know, uh, created the Pleiades and Orion, look at Behemoth and Leviathan. In other words, God has all sorts of reasons for creating the world that don't have anything to do with us. In Genesis, but he creates humans on day six, as a, an encore to day six, but all the other days when he creates, he also declares them good. So this idea that it's the sort of Christian idea that the creation only exists to serve human beings, first of all, it's not a Christian idea. Um, in fact, the Christian idea is quite different. And I think that's important, one, to sort of vindicate uh, Scripture, but also because any Christian or Jew that's actually interested in caring for the environment, you've got all the intellectual resources that you need. You don't need radical environmental ideology to care for the natural world. That's something that should be uncontroversial. The question is whether the claims of radical climate change are true, um, and then as I ask the questions, you know, what's happening, what's causing it, is it bad, and what should we do about it? Those are separate questions we, we, that could have separate answers. And, and, and as you, you've written here, the environmental movement goes far beyond uh, just the environment and treats human beings as the problem. Absolutely. You know, John Kerry was at a conference last week or two mm -hmm. weeks ago, and he actually said, you know, we could do a lot to solve the CO2 problem if we stopped farming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if we just well, if, the word if we human. stopped eating and stopped you know, eating, we just stopped kill breathing. off, we got seven billion people on the planet. We yeah. get rid of four or five billion. We're in good Prune shape. Prune them down, absolutely. I mean, years ago, I got a letter. We're making light of that, but that yeah. seems like that's actually what yeah. they think would be a good thing. Well, that certainly, I'm not going to accuse all environmentalists of thinking this. But I'm just John is, Kerry. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll stick yeah, with we'll John. Yeah, we'll stick with He's... Kerry. But <laughs> the reality is, if you if you get into the environmental and creation care space, it doesn't take you long to find someone that's deeply misanthropic and to realize that a lot of what they think is not based on a careful look at the evidence. It's just based on this kind of moral intuition that humans are the problem. And to solve the problems of nature, we need a lot fewer humans. Okay, number one, is the earth warming? Is the earth warming? So the, the question here depends on from what baseline. So if we're talking about is the earth warming since 1000 AD, if you were to sort of look at that trend line, look at the best evidence, doesn't look like there is. In fact, it's probably slightly warmer on average on the Earth's surface around 1000 AD because of the so-called medieval warming period. Um, 
If you, however, uh, say started at 1850, sort of the beginning of the real uptick in the Industrial Revolution. Which is their usual that's, starting Yeah, point. usually started yeah. 1850 the or 1870. Industrial Revolution. So started back, the Industrial back Revolution. Back when we started making things productive and yeah. we made people live longer, live that's healthier. Right. Allowed billions, billions of people, people to out survive. of poverty. I mean, exactly. Little things like yeah, that. Yeah, little, little trivial kind of improvements here right. and there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but let's just say we're going to put a pen in, right, our sort of graph and say, let's 1850. 1850 and look at the best evidence from 1850 to the present. I think, yeah, it's it, we are warmer now than we were then of roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. So, OK, if that's what we're talking about, that's very narrow since from 1850 to the present. Earth's a little bit warmer. That's a, I think. OK, fine. Two degrees Fahrenheit. Two degrees centigrade. Fahrenheit centigrade. Two degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah. So less than that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Centigrade. Yeah. So continue. This yeah, is... so the second would be, are we causing it? That's a separate question, right? So you can observe something. You can observe polar bears looking for places to, to swim or whatever. You can say, well, okay, this seems to be evidence that the Earth is warming. That doesn't tell you what causes it. Is it a change in sunspot cycles and magnetic features? Is it something we're doing? Is it some other thing we don't know about? Um, now, the assumption of the, the sort of climate panickers is that human beings are the primary cause of this. And this isn't without foundation because we know that certain types of gases, uh, such as methane, water vapor, and carbon dioxide, are greenhouse gases, which just basically means that um, they can absorb more infrared radiation. So you get sunlight comes in, hits the Earth's surface, some of it bounces off the Earth, uh, back out past into space, some of it gets absorbed in the atmosphere, it's what's responsible for keeping our Earth's surface much warmer than it would be otherwise. So that's the greenhouse effect. So the idea is that, okay, we know that humans have been adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere since, again, let's just pick 1850, um, and CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So it, at least hypothetically, it could be that our introduction of additional CO2 into the atmosphere has caused this additional warming. Now, it's actually much, much harder uh, to nail that down. That, that, that kind of makes sense at a theoretical level. Um, but it's actually not easy to prove that. And we know there are other potential sources of warming. Is this, is, is this correlation or is this causation? At this point, it's just, co so correlation would just be, we see warming um, and, and we we're see an increase CO2. in CO2. It, it, but... Right, that'd be correlation. But then you have a kind of theoretical account of how this well, could have been. Well, right? well, you know Jerry Corsi. Yeah, Jerry Corsi has been on, and he's written another trip. You, yeah. you, they get all the best writers on yes. this show. Um, he points out that right, we're right now at about 300, 420 parts per million. Yeah, billion. Yeah, billion. Or, or parts per million. You're per, right. You got and, it. Uh, and that's just an infinitesimal amount of the atmosphere. Yeah, Most it's of it's oxygen. Gas. And so the idea we've got this trace gas, yeah. which is driving all this change, when it could be the sun, it could, could be, the, be the earth rotation, it right. could be all sorts of things that are yeah. happening. And yet, if you examine the deeper agenda, which is an anti-human agenda, and I'm going to go out on yeah. a limb here, um, that's the only thing we can really control, carbon dioxide. Of and we can do that by shutting down the Western, or actually now uh, the global the whole world. industrial economy. That's right. Shut down what we're doing and prevent the poor countries that still need to do it from doing it themselves. That'd be the way to shut this down. Now, it could be a trace gas, but, you know, hormones are trace chemicals in our body, and they can have major effects. And so the, the theoretical assumption is not just that the CO2 is causing the warming, because we know just on from physics that the, the amount of warming that you can get from the CO2 is actually pretty minimal, and you have to keep doubling the concentration in order to increase the warming by one degree. Well, we've only gone up 50% yeah, in so, 100, yeah. 170 years. Yeah, so you'd have to go from, let's say you go from three to six, you, and that, let's say that raises the, the temperature one degree you have to go and you have to double it again to get one more degree. And so very quickly, it becomes almost impossible to increase the warming in that way. But the theoretical assumption is that there are all these feedback mechanisms that are triggered. And so a positive feedback is a feedback that amplifies the effects yeah. of, the, of the warming. And a negative feedback would be one that, that sort of mitigates um, the, the effects. Most of the models that are, that's where we get these predictions of catastrophic global warming. They're, we don't observe what we can't observe the future. They're based upon these theoretical models that predict what's supposed to well, happen. Weren't these the same theoretical models that Al Gore used in Inconvenient Absolutely. Truth, and yes. they proved to be flat? Well, I mean, astonishingly one of these, wrong. This is the key thing: is that the models. I mean, predict, think about yes. that. Al Gore and John Kerry as presidential candidates. Yes, 
I know, but you know, and they may be doing more damage now. Who knows? <laughs> you know, behind the scenes. Should have let him yeah, be president. But the <laughs> models predict way more warming than we actually observe. So right. we, the, okay. war, mo, the warming we observe is about what you would expect just from the CO2 increase itself. So the takeaway from this, if you're listening or watching, is it'd be very suspicious about CO2 as, a, as an important metric. As a, Yeah, or as a major driver of catastrophic climate change. Now, do, you, do you have another culprit for driving catastrophic? Is there anything else humans could be doing? Well, I don't think any doing? of this is catastrophic. I, I actually okay. think the I think it's possible that the warming is the result of the CO2, or, but we really just don't know at the moment. But if, if there's more CO2, better for growing plants. Well, yeah. It makes, if there's a rise in temperature, it makes more land arable. Mm -hmm. It means something like Siberia could become agricultural. Yeah, absolutely. It would increase. So that's the third question. Is it bad? Okay, right? let's because, go to number three. Yeah, is it pivoted bad? There. And because the assumption is that if the earth's warming and we're causing it, that it's bad. We would only know it was bad if we knew what the optimum temperature was, right? So that we say, okay, well, we, this is the optimum temperature for all the things that we want on balance. And then if we were moving away from it, that would be bad. If we were moving toward it, that would be good. The problem is we don't know what the optimum temperature is. I mean, I would assume for human well-being, it's somewhere between zero and 100 degrees centigrade, right? Um, but even the UN and it's the IPCC, um, they, they estimate, so this is the kind of official uh, UN estimate, that moderate warming in the near term is probably net positive. In other words, it has more benefits than costs. It's going to be only the, the warming toward the end of this century that they project will be somewhat bad, though even in that case, it's actually really End of really this century? That end would of be this century, 70s. the warming would get severe enough that it would have more costs than benefits. That's the way to think about it. It's not a catastrophe, even in the UN estimate. Um, people don't know that. Um, and so, But that's their argument based upon the projected Well, let's get models. into who's making this argument. IPPC is a, a, a piece of the United Nations. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which right. is the, in the entity created by the UN not to figure out whether we're causing climate change, but to figure out uh, how bad our effect on the climate is. So it presupposes the account, and then their mandate is just to find out whether it's how bad or good it is. And so it's already kind of been set up uh, with the theoretical assumptions in place. But even having said that, if you look at the official reports, um, they're actually much more modest in the things that they describe than you're going to get if you're just sort of following the headlines. Interesting thing about their reports is their numbers seem pretty modest, and yeah. I've been forced to read about oh, this. Yeah. The words are dire. Yes, the words are dire. And if you read the Summary for policymakers, which is usually written by an English major that doesn't even know the science, right? And so it's the summary. Nobody's really reading the report. It's always hyped up and very often, uh, in fact, Steve Coonan in his terrific book, Unsettled, points this out. There's a, often a chasm between the report itself and the summary. Steve Coonan is... Yeah, uh... yeah he was a, a, actually in the Obama administration. He's a physicist. He's written a book called Unsettled. That just, you know, just a careful, intellectually honest analysis of, of what the evidence says. Uh, and people don't often realize that, but even if you just go with the official UN testimony, we're not talking catastrophe. We would be talking about, okay, something we might want to try to do something about or something like that. Now, I think even that's too much. I think the reality is, I mean, I'll, I'll give my own view. Yeah, we, we, there's been some moderate warming. I think it's probably likely that we're a, a contributor to it. It seems plausible to me. I don't think it's bad. I think it's probably on balance good. And the range of variation is well within natural variation. That's the key thing. People think that if you tell them, okay, well, but climate changes all the time, they'll say, yeah, but we're causing um, anomalous climate change. It's heating up much more quickly now than it has in the past. It's not true. Anybody that can look at uh, you know, historic climate data from the ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland knows we've got, had massive variations, obviously, in, in the climate of the earth on its surface, and we've had massive variations in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so if the climate were highly sensitive to variations in CO2, we would see that in the records of the Is there any the actual climate. evidence of damage from climate change? I mean, I know everything gets attributed to right. climate change. If, if there's a tornado, climate change. <laughs> if there's, you know, if... Uh, there's a drought. There's a drought, it's climate yeah. change. If the Yankees lose the pennant, it's climate change. I yeah. mean, you know, it's sort of uh, all these everything's things. attributed to climate Everything change. Everything bad. Can yeah. we do, we do we have like a, a set of examples you can actually no. say climate change has caused this bad outcome? None whatsoever. And in fact, the theoretical predictions is that climate change, so we sort of lead to warming, the warming leads to change, 
And then those lead to bad things like more intense hurricanes, um, more frequent hurricanes and monsoons, more droughts, all these kinds of things. Those are theoretical predictions of what would happen, but none of that is observed. There's been no trend whatsoever over the last century, for instance, in terms of the number of hurricanes or the intensity of hurricanes. Again, Kunin treats this all this very well. This is widely known to the people that sort of study this stuff, um, that all these predicted trends aren't now happening. And so when the media tells you, oh, this is the result of climate change, first of all, they're playing a shell game because any individual instance of weather can't be used as proof of overall climate. Climate is about the sort of average of weather over a long period of time. So any individual storm is, can't be attributed. Well, and actually, the number of violent storms have been reduced. In That's the, last the funny thing. If anything, years. it's probably slightly better. It's there are fewer hurricanes. hurricanes. That's there are right. Fewer tornadoes. Yeah, that's the sort of funny thing about it is that not only is there no trend, the trend seems to be slightly in the other direction. So number four, it's warming. We're causing it. That's bad. Solution. The solutions are stunning. I mean, yes. really. And this is where I began to think this has got to be cynical. Absolutely. Because you, and the other thing I I just am mystified about it. There are a lot of smart guys I've worked with on Wall Street and other places, you know, 190 IQs, and they're still talking about things as if uh, climate change were an existential problem. Oh, yeah. Bob Rubin. Yeah. Who he's a smart guy. It's pretty smart guy. Yeah. He's talking about existential risk, which brings me in to the question: You've been studying this longer. Mm -hmm. Do they really believe it? Or is yeah. cynical because we also have something called the climate industrial complex. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So of course, so I would say it's probably a mix. I, I think of it in terms of concentric circles. You have people that just get sucked in and don't know anything about it, and they're just believing the media. Uh, then you have smart people that it's not their subject. Those would be trust. most Republicans. Yeah, they're yeah, light, so they're light green. Of, yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Like most Republicans, exactly. And then frankly, most Democrats, right? They just they care about the earth and they just trust the New York Times headlines or whatever. Um, and then you've got some people that are sort of true believers and do think it. I think there's some people that sincerely believe this, though they're usually much more nuanced because they know the details are complicated. And then I think you have to have some cynical people. So anyone that really thinks this is an existential threat, that thinks the Paris uh, uh, Agreement, which was voluntary and was basically a bunch of countries saying, okay, we're going to kind of slow our, uh, the, you know, the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere, but China and India, who are the biggies, aren't doing it. Um, and even the countries that agreed to comply are not doing it. In fact, the United States, which did not agree to it, um, has done more because of our shift from coal to natural gas, which is actually, you know, uh, as the other side would measure these things, that's, that's an improvement. So that's the sort of irony. Um, that's the kind of reality. The idea that just slightly reducing this is going to make a difference when you've got China just putting massive numbers of, of, of coal plants online every week makes no Two sense. Two per week. Yeah, just, just on and on and on. And they're not going to stop doing that. I wouldn't expect them to stop doing it. They've got a lot of development still to do. And so this idea that something like this, or maybe this plus 10 even, is going to get us to where they think we ought to go, it's just ridiculous. It's just basic arithmetic. And they've got to know this as well. And so the fact that they're not saying we need to do everything we can to to make our electrical grid nuclear rich, right? We need to be building nuclear plants as fast as we can. The fact that they're not saying that tells me that at some level they're just cynical and know this is about this is about this is a power game rather than about actually saving the earth. Well, and I get the name of these egregious bills in Congress. What is it? The Inflation Reduction Act, do I have <laughs> yeah. that right? Right. It, was, it it well it did nothing it exacerbated inflation That's right. but but where that money went is to me the most interesting and upsetting part with the most of it, big chunks of it went, I think what there's a 400 billion dollar climate uh, fund yes. which is going to be run by John Podesta you know I mean some of this stuff you yeah. almost think has got to be made up and right? another half a trillion half a billion, half a trillion dollars of climate subsidies yeah yeah, for the who's that go to? It goes to Goldman Sachs. It sure. goes to wealthy investors of and, and the left. Yeah, team. and now you've got the Biden administration wanting uh, the the American people to pivot to electric cars by 2030 and 2035 at a rate that's just simply pivot. impossible. I mean, a, a pivot. Yeah. It's not. A, yeah, it's not a pivot. It's a oh, shove. Uh, yeah, yeah. Electri <laughs> electric trucks. Yeah, exactly. And the military wants electric tanks. Yeah, 
You yeah, know, you could where they plug them in and you well, you got to plug them clear, in. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem, and so it's not really <laughs> fixing the problem. Like it's like okay, fine if you want an electrical car, but if the grid is still using hydrocarbons, uh, you're just transferring the place where the hydrocarbons are being used. So people that are telling me we need to all drive electric cars, but they're not actually doing anything uh, to change the electric grid realistically by adding nuclear. I mean, it's just not serious. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it except it's just absolutely absurd. So even if you think the earth's warming catastrophically, we're causing it, and it's bad. Uh, there is no reason to think that any of the kind of political solutions on offer will make any difference whatsoever. And so the question is, if you're worried about it, what's the best thing to do? And I argue the best thing to do, even if you're worried about it, is to help people to adapt. Uh, because it, the richer you are and the wealthier a country is, the easier it is for them to adapt. It's always going to be an increase in the cost of energy or a change in the climate or the local atmosphere. That's going to affect the poor the most significantly. And so what we should want is poor countries to develop, even if that means using, as it will, more hydrocarbons in the near term. And then the, the bonus to that is that once people get wealthy enough, they start caring a lot more about the climate than they do when they don't know where the next meal is coming well, from. Well, but why should you care about climate if you don't have enough to Absolutely. Eat? Yeah, you should. And, but you know, we talk, you mentioned China. I mean, China is a massive beneficiary of this. Absolutely. If you wanted to develop an agenda to impoverish the people that they would like to uh, rule, yeah, this this would be it. This and be you perfect. know, just but it's interesting. China is a lot shrewder about their <sighs> agenda than we are. They are. You know, they've got the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes, they're very. They're very. They've hard. gone around the world. They've helped with infrastructure in South America, Central they're America, Africa. They're giving loans to develop coal plants that the IMF and the World Bank will not give. So China's giving loans to developed world. Well, that's the, just, that's the bite. That's the bite. The that's the, those are the two subsets. So yeah. if you look at, if you look at the um, NGO or the World Bank, the I, you know, International Monetary Fund, yeah. all kinds of strings attached. In the first oh, place, absolutely. they want, they want the country to be uh, um, equity driven. Absolutely. And uh, they want, uh, you know, they want got, they want education to be suffused with gender ideology, and they want you there. flying yeah. the flags to absolutely. celebrate that. Yes, absolutely. And then they, one of the other things they want is they want uh, uh, climate friendly development, which yeah. means wind and solar. That's and if right. you're in Africa or Central America, you're asking, "Are you kidding? We've been can trying. We get, can we get electricity <laughs> can everywhere, we, can please? We try, <laughs> can absolutely. we try a little diesel generator, maybe no, to absolutely. for the village? So." We're we're offering things that they don't want. China's offering what they do want, and yeah. China's winning this uh, yeah. this competition. Absolutely. And then the the other piece of this is that uh, the move toward car batteries and uh, solar panels <laughs> massively benefits China because they've got a access to a lot of the rare earth minerals and lithium and the things that we don't want to either don't have or don't want to mine here. Um, so if this were a, like a Beijing conspiracy of the People's Republic of China. Um, to get the West to destroy itself economically and then to transition to a type of energy uh, that will benefit them massively, it would look exactly the same. I don't actually think this is a conspiracy. I think this probably is mostly cooked up by Westerners, unfortunately. They're just but it taking might as well advantage be, of it. Yeah, but yeah. It, might as well be a, it might as well be a conspiracy. This is how it would look. Well, I, I want to set down my marker, though. I really do care enormously about the habitat and species you know i've got 75 oh, acres out yeah. on the side of a mountain and we've got every it, it's been and 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 the, the this climate see the, this wind and solar is insane it's the disaster it takes it takes 500,000 yeah. pounds of minerals to create a one 1,000 battery yeah. that goes into a car and where are those mines going to take they're not going to dig in connecticut no it's going to be child labor in africa and it's going to be china and places like that um, it's just the worst thing you can think of. This idea that you care about birds, and so you want to put a bunch of giant guillotines in the air everywhere. I just, I, I'm not following my, the logic. My favorite, <laughs> and I use this too much, in California, they call wind farms, I think, uh, condor, the eagle, oh, yeah. condor Cuisinarts. Oh, yeah. It's depressing. But that's the reality. And this, the, the other thing is that, as you said, Bill, people that actually care about these things, uh, they need to disentangle that care from the climate change agenda because it sucks all the air out of the room and actually prevents us from focusing on things that actually benefit. We have real habitat issues, yes. real species, Absolutely. real environment, real rivers, all sorts of things we need yeah. to be mindful of, but it's not. That's how I got into this initially. I honestly yeah. thought, oh, it's about that. It turns out it's about something else. Well, Jay, we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> we did. <laughs> We've got to get the word out. And you're doing it. I, and and uh, if you're not too weighed down by your new title. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive, though. That's a big operation. I'm really, I'm really. It's, yeah, uh, it's terrific. You're and, able to do a lot of good from there. Oh, it's terrific. I'm just so excited about the stuff here that you're doing. It's yeah. great to be part of the team. Yeah, well, this is great. So this has been the Bill Walton Show. I've been here with Jay Richards, uh, a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, assessor of all things, uh, I don't know, what economic, cultural, and uh, All things moral. depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, we, uh, As you know, we like to produce shows you like and would love to hear your comments um, on our Substack uh, page and also on our website, which you could be reached at BillWaltonShow.com. Uh, please send us your ideas about uh, shows and, and uh, people and topics you'd like us to get into, and we will do that. Um, and as always, you can find us on all the major podcasts and other video platforms like Rumble and YouTube and Substack and mm-hmm. CPAC now on Monday night. And you can find Jay Richards at Heritage. Heritage.org. And your Jay.Richards at, 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 at. Yeah. And actually, my Twitter is at, Tw- at Dr. Jay Richards. Great. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so thanks for joining. And we'll be back uh, again with ho- hopefully something else that you will like as much as I like this one. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Bill. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining. 